As you notice from the sermon title, A Victorious 2020. And that's what God has in store for every one of us. Every one of us. Jesus, you know, when you think of somebody giving a final talk to a group, and you think about, well, what, you know, you, what's the most passionate desire of your heart? That's what you're going to share with those when you say, okay, I'm not going to see them for a while. And we see that in the great gospel commission of Matthew 28. Jesus had one great overriding concern on his heart when he left this earth. And he said here, Go, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now, there are two reasons that this great gospel commission would be a success. Two reasons for that. One is the verse that preceded what I just read, verse 18. Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All power, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. All power everywhere is given to Jesus Christ. Now, I shared with you before when I was first going to Indonesia, first time, and the Australian embassy had just been blown up by terrorists in Jakarta. And also the Marriott Hotel had just been blown up by terrorists. And I'm thinking of going to Jakarta. And the Lord I knew was the one directing me there but Satan tried to make me fearful and in some parts of the world you have some strikes against you being white being American and being Christian those were kind of three things a little bit against me there though we have some wonderful Christian brothers and sisters in Indonesia so as I was getting a little fearful, you know what to do when you get afraid, get on your knees. So I knelt down by my bed and began praying. And this was the verse that God just brought right to me. All power in heaven and earth is given to me. I thought, wow, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Every square inch of Indonesia, it's under the authority of Jesus. What do I have to be afraid of? I think the second time I went to Indonesia, Patty said, um, I wish you could have a bodyguard. <laughs> you know, our wives, they're, they love us and they're concerned. And I said, Patty, I got the best bodyguard there is. If necessary, I got a whole host of angels around me. Yeah, not a, not a problem at all. So we need to remember that as we go into 2020. Jesus has all authority in planet Earth. And not only here, but throughout the universe. And that's why the Gospel Commission could be fulfilled. Because I guarantee us, he knew Satan would try to stop it. But Satan does not have power over Jesus to stop the Gospel from going forth to the world. Jesus has all power. Now the second reason that the gospel could go forth in power is in our scripture today. Acts 1. Being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which said he, you have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. The number two reason is that the gospel would be a success. And the church would still be around in 2020. 
is because the baptism of the Holy Spirit was to be poured out on the believers. That is absolutely necessary because remember, they had been with Jesus three and a half years. They had heard him teach three and a half years. They saw him minister, heal the sick, cast out devils, raise the dead, three and a half years. They themselves preached the gospel, healed the sick, cast out devils, three and a half years. You think they're ready? But Jesus said, You're not. You got to wait for one thing the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And they did. They, they waited for that. And when the Holy Spirit came and they were filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there was power in their life as they had never had before. And that same power is available to you and me, by the way, in 2020. And when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, this, what we celebrate, Christ's sacrifice, his victory over death, over Satan, is why he has authority in earth. And it's because of what we celebrate today, we can have the baptism of the Holy Spirit in our life. If what we celebrate today had not taken place, then those words would be empty and would be meaningless. When we look at Christ and his conflict with Satan, I, I'm sure, you know, this conflict began in heaven between Satan and Christ. And then, you know, Satan came down this earth and then deceived Adam and Eve and he started taking control down here. I'm sure Satan was delighted when Jesus became a human being. He thought, okay, I now can have victory over him. I'm sure he was a little bit excited about that. He'd had victory with every other human being in this world. I'm sure he could have it with, he felt he could have it with Christ. Well, was he in for a surprise? Christ defeated Satan every step of the way. Every time there was an encounter between Jesus and Satan, Satan lost. Satan lost. He overcame every temptation that Satan would throw his way. And you and I think we're tempted sometimes, and of course we are. Our temptations, compared to what Satan threw at Christ, you can imagine what Satan would have thrown at Jesus. But he withstood them all for two reasons. He had to be a perfect, sinless sacrifice to die for us. And secondly, as you've heard me say many times, he overcame those temptations for us because he knew we don't have the power to overcome them. And so he could develop a perfect human righteousness, perfect obedience to God's law, perfect victory over every temptation and sin. He did that for us so that now when we accept Jesus Christ, he says, here is my righteousness, and it's ours. It's ours. Jesus died that death that we deserve, so we don't have to die it. And he was resurrected. I'm sure that was kind of an, a bit of an exciting time for Satan. He says, okay, now he's dead. He's in the grave. He inspired Rome, put that huge rock in front of it, put the Roman seal on it, put guards out there. So, so he can't get out. That's kind of small thinking. <laughs> Nothing can keep God out. And um, we know the story. The stone was rolled away and Jesus was resurrected. If there had been no resurrection, that, it, that, that was as significant an event as everything else because if there had been no resurrection, everything else is lost. Everything, everything Jesus said was a lie if there were no resurrection. Because he says here in Romans chapter 1, verse 4, declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Significant event. What does it mean to us? You do not need to fear Satan in 2020. At all. You don't, you don't, 
don't need to. He has been defeated. You know, the, Jesus sent out the 70 and preached the gospel, healed the sick, cast out devils. And they came back and, and they said, Lord, even the devils are subject to us in your name. They were amazed at that. The power of Jesus' name. And Jesus said this, Luke 10, 18. He says, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Satan was defeated. That's why in the name of Jesus, you can hold your ground. And Satan need not ever overcome you, defeat you. Jesus also said in that context, which is one of my favorite verses, he said, behold, I give you power. The Greek word is authority. Remember, Jesus says all authority is given to him. He gives us that authority. Picture that. Here's authority. Here, I'm going to give you that authority. I give you authority. I give you power. It's in his name. I give you authority. I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. That's talking about Satan. And over all the power of the enemy. See, there's no power of Satan that you cannot overcome. Never let Satan put fear in your heart. I don't care what you're facing in 2020. Never let him put fear there because you have authority over him in Jesus Christ. You see, Satan only has one weapon. You think he has more, he's got one. The lie. The lie. He's good at it. He'll lie to you that you're not forgiven. He'll lie to you that God's not going to provide for you. He'll lie to you that you don't have eternal life. He'll lie to you, lie to you, lie to you. And if you believe the lie, he's got you. But for every one of his lies, there's the promise in the word of God. Now we make a choice. Are we going to believe the lie or the word of God? And I pray in 2020, we will always choose to believe the word of God. That's where the victory's at. And by the way, when you're believing in the word of God, when you're believing in the promises of God, you're not simply believing in written words, you're believing in a person. God, that's behind the word. So don't, you know, don't separate that. You're believing in God himself. You're believing in Jesus Christ. So in 2020, also, we can be filled with the Spirit. We can have victory over the temptation Satan sends their way. Paul says this, Romans 6, 11, Likewise, reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. In Jesus Christ, we can have victory. I've shared to you how that works. It's all connected with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When you ask God to fill you with the Spirit, who is living in you most fully? Christ. When Christ is living in you, you have his victory. So when you're tempted, you've heard me say it many times, I'll probably say it sometimes through 2020, when you have Christ in you and you're tempted to be impatient, don't ask God to give you patience. Ask Jesus to give you his patience. There's a difference. Whenever you're tempted to be unforgiving in 2020, and I guarantee you, you will get hurt in 2020, emotionally. You will. You might even get hurt by someone in the church. It happens. What do you do? Do you play mental games to try to get rid of that hurt? No. You do turn your mind away from whoever did it and said it, and then you ask Jesus, who's in you, to give you his forgiveness. It's really that simple. That's righteous by faith when it comes to the sanctification side. So when you do that, what's happening? Jesus is living out his life, his obedience in you, his forgiveness, his patience, his faith. If you're facing a situation and you're saying, oh, I wish I had more faith, guess who's in you? Jesus. Guess whose faith is available to you? Jesus. Ask him to give it to you. <laughs> Lord, Give me your faith here so I can trust you, so I can believe you. See, that, that's, that's it. And that's why I, you know, you've heard me say many times, ask God to fill you with his spirit day after day. 
We don't have to worry about anything in 2020 because I like the text in Philippians 4. Be careful for nothing. Now that's another way of saying don't worry about anything. How many of you would like to go through 2020 and not worry about one single thing? How many would like to do that? <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> that's what God wants. Well, here's how you can do it. Be careful for nothing. Don't worry about anything. But instead, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. If you do that, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There's the key. And also that text in Isaiah, that will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, on God. Why? Because he trusts you. So again, everything, you know, everything with God is so simple. It really is. And if you hear a presentation that's really convoluted and complex, man kind of got in there messing with it. With God, it's simple. It's not complicated. Christ defeated sickness and disease. It tells us that on the cross. So you know, sickness and disease is not in your eternal future. You may deal with some stuff now, but you're not going to have to deal with it in your eternal future. That's going to be a nice time. The older I get, the more I appreciate that. Christ defeated death. You don't have to fear death. You have eternal life. You know that. You have it right now. It says if, if you have Jesus, you have life. Have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? You have life. Whose life? His life. You have his eternal life. He gives you his eternal life. You have eternal life right now. And so, if we die, we simply go to sleep. Jesus didn't call death of his saints a death, and that, as many times it's taught, because when he was talking to them about Lazarus, they said, Jesus said, well, Lazarus sleeps. And they say, oh, if he's asleep, he's okay. He's, then he said, no, no, you don't understand. He's dead, but actually he's asleep. There's a text that says, God's the God of the living, not the dead. So on God's side, those that die are sleeping, and in a sense, they're still alive in that sense because they're just moments away from being resurrected and be with God. Don't have to fear, fear that. I don't know. I, I would know whether I was going to show this or not, but when I was, sometimes as I think of death, when I, I don't know how many of you grew up believing in Santa Claus. I did. And so we just got through Christmas. And I, I don't believe it now, by the way. But we, <laughs> when, when I was little, um, we, <laughs> yeah, when I was uh, little, you know, you know how it was if you believed in that, you know, you your parents said go to bed and uh, go to sleep because at least in our family we opened up the gifts Christmas morning and so oh, I had a hard time getting to sleep Christmas Eve but I finally did and Christmas morning was always so excited what was those gifts going to be you know for some reason I, we all look at it a different way death is something like that when I die it's kind of like I'm going to go to sleep it's Christmas Eve and boy, when I wake up, oh, well, there are lots of gifts for me. That's kind of how I look at it. <laughs> and it's true, you know. It, many years may pass. We don't know that. We're asleep. But in our next conscious memory, we're awake and there's Jesus. It's not so bad, you know, folks. There's a lot worse things in life. So that's what we're celebrating today in our communion service. And I might emphasize, too, that all that went on, all the victory Christ had, w would not have taken place without him being a man of prayer. That was at the heart of everything he did. Remember at the very beginning of his ministries, 40 days of prayer and fasting, that prepared him for his, his ministry. He had just been baptized in water, filled with the Spirit, and the Spirit led him in the wilderness. 40 days of prayer and fasting, and then he faced his greatest temptations and got the victory. You know, the victory at the cross really took place in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's where the victory was won. 
Father, if possible, let this pass from me. It was overwhelming. He didn't see how he could get through it. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That's where the victory was gained. And that's how it would be for us, too, by the way. If we are not men and women of prayer, we're not going to have the victories God wants. But if we're men and women of prayer, that's where the victory will be gained. That's where your relationship with God is strengthened in so many ways. And then when whatever challenge comes our way, we're already connected. We don't have an ambulance religion. You know, where you don't need the ambulance until you're sick. You don't need God until you're facing a challenge. That's not our religion. Our religion is we stay with God all the time. And whenever a crisis comes, the ambulance is there already. Jesus is there. He's there to help and whatever that need will be. So we too must be men and women of prayer. And the church, the church began with a 10-day prayer meeting. You know that, for Pentecost. Holy Spirit was poured out. And I know when the Lord, I felt the Lord was calling me to be a pastor here, one thing that really kept coming to me, very strong prayer ministries, prayer ministries. And I didn't know what all would be involved there, but I knew God wanted us as a congregation to have many focuses on prayer, different prayer ministries. And I didn't know what all they'd be, but as I've been reflecting in the past two years, we've been praying for the Baptist of the Holy Spirit every day. We've been praying for revival. Prayer partners have been encouraged. You might remember that. Ike had a sign-up sheet, and some of you are participating in that, that there's an individual that you call, maybe not every day, but several times a week, and pray together. We also have our prayer calendar. We gave those out last week. We have the prayer calendar where every day of the month there are names of individuals on that day and we encourage folks to pray for those individuals. I hope you use this. Take it out every day and pray for those on the prayer calendar for that day. That way throughout the month you're going to get prayed for sometime. Also, I can put together prayer ministries, ministries that we have. And we encourage you to turn that over. And each day there's another ministry to pray for. I, am, I absolutely believe that prayer releases God to do what we ask him to do. You've heard me say that many times. That's why prayer is so absolutely essential. We have our prayer bowls. Golden bowl. I put a couple of requests in there today. I open it up and <laughs> it's getting pretty full. I'm going to encourage you to keep using this because we're encouraging our members, and I hope you remember this, every day pray for the requests that are in this prayer bowl. Every day. Remember, there, I've given a number of sermons, and we had a study on prayer. The more prayer, the more power. When we unite together in prayer for all the requests in the prayer bowl, there's more power in that than just one person praying. Also, when you have an answer, don't forget to put it over here. Those are the answers. That's the golden prayer bowl. Also, we have our garden of prayer before prayer meeting. If you want to have a very special time of united prayer, join Ike down in the West Wing Sabbath School room on Wednesdays. I don't know if you knew this, but Ike and his wife, Barbara, I think it's every Friday, come here to church, and they pray for every pew. Where you've been sitting, where you're sitting today, you've been prayed for by them. God knows who's going to be here. And they pray that God will pour out his spirit and bless whoever is here sitting in these pews. And they pray in the different rooms and in the entrances to the church. And Sabbath morning at 8.55, West Wing Sabbath School again, Ike and those that want to join him, pray for the services of the Sabbath. Sabbath School and church service. I thank the Lord that he's led us into many prayer ministries. I am convinced whatever good God is doing here at Clearview is because of prayer. I believe that. I'm not just telling you that. I believe it. And as we were <clears throat> approaching the new year, the Lord brought to my mind another prayer focus. <laughs> 
you're all going to have a lot to pray for if you choose to do it. Um, you, have an, you have an insert in your bulletin. I'd like for you to take that out. It's a simple prayer focus. For 2020, when I thought of 2020, I, you know, you think of eyesight, right? Well, there's a lot of people blind to the gospel. A lot of people blind to the truths of God's word in the time in which we're living. So that's kind of what this is about. But the Lord put it on my heart to share this and encourage you to do this. There's a text in Acts that's always fascinated me, and it's on the first here of your, your, your additional prayer focus, Acts 2, 47. They were praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. I found that interesting. God brought the early church in favor with the people around them. God did that. Here's what I'm asking you to do every day in 2020. Number one, pray for God to bring this church <clears throat> into favor with this community. Now, I don't know how he'll do that, but I know he'll do it if we ask. Number one. Number two, I want to encourage you to choose five individuals to pray for every day. These are individuals that live in the area. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's a former Adventist you know. Maybe it's a family member that's not coming to church. Whatever. You decide. Ask God who should be on your list. Five people to pray for every day. And here's what I want you to pray for. You've got two things that God will remove the veil of blindness so they can see biblical truth. That comes from 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But if the gospel be hid, you've got neighbors, you've got friends, you've got family members where the gospel is hid from them. They don't see it. If the gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. This word being hid from them, the Greek is a veil. There's a veil over their eyes. They don't know it, but there's a veil over their eyes so they can't see. And I'm asking you to pray every day for whoever you got on your list that God be specific. Lord, I ask that you will remove the veil from John's eyes. Be specific. And number two, ask God to cast down the strongholds of Satan in their lives. This is 2 Corinthians. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty, through God, to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, think of this. You have the power in prayer to ask God to cast down, here's the words, imaginations and every high thing that assaults itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, that's, those are pretty powerful words. That's what God's telling you. You can claim this promise, you can pray this verse for those on your list. There may be strongholds in their minds that's giving them strange imaginations that are against God, thoughts that are against the knowledge of God. You can ask God to cast those down. Be specific for those individuals, Jim, Mary, John, whoever, whoever God puts on your heart. Now, I'm not going to tell you what to do besides that. But I will say this, two things. One, I also suggest you put those names in the prayer bowl so we can all pray for them. And number two, be open to divine appointments. What do I mean by that? Well, for instance, there's an individual I go for, I walk our dog and he walks his dog and he's not really too Christian. We've had some talks. Uh, we don't see each other every day. But as I start praying for him, see, those are divine appointments. You don't make them. God makes them. 
be open to those concerning those you're praying for. Don't think it's happenstance or simply a coincidence. It's not. If you're praying for them, God is giving you a divine appointment with that person. Then when you have that, whisper a little prayer. <laughs> what do you want me to say, Lord? Don't put pressure on yourself. What do you want me to say? And you will be surprised. I know you've experienced this before. You'll be surprised what God will do. God can take simple words and speak to the heart because you've been praying. You've been praying for God to do just that. So I encourage you, for 2020, add that to your prayer ministries. Well, today we are celebrating the Lord's Supper, which, as I said, because of what we are celebrating, everything I've talked about today is true. We do have open communion, which means all are welcome to participate. We do ask that non-baptized children observe. And um, I just pray it'll be a wonderful blessing for all of us. And I invite our elders, deacon, and deaconesses to come forward at this time. Reading from 1 Corinthians. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The congregation remains seated. The elders will kneel for prayer. Heavenly Father, what an honor and a blessing and a joy and a privilege it is to gather here on this high Sabbath, Lord, to partake in Holy Communion. And Lord, I pray that you would be with us as we partake of this bread which is symbolic of your broken and tattered body as, that, as it hung there on Calvary's cross. And Father, prior to partaking this morning, I pray that you would search our hearts, Lord, that you would examine us, because Lord, we know that we are truly not worthy to receive this holy ordinance. And if you see anything within us, dear God, that is not of you, Father, we pray that you would make us worthy because only you can do that. Remove anything from us, Lord, that is not accordance to your liking. And Father, we want to be like Jesus. And Father, I also pray that as we partake of this broken bread, may we truly reflect a life experience of walking with you as we await your soon coming. In your name we pray, amen. Continuing with verse 25. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. 
congregation remain seated. The elders will kneel for prayer. Lord, we come to you asking that you'll give us appreciation for your reconciliation through your shed blood. May we accept forgiveness for our repented sins. Fill our stony hearts with your blood as we partake of these symbols today. We thank you for what you have done and continue to do for us freely. In Christ's name, amen.
This bread represents that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, eternal God with the Father, was willing to step down from his throne, the glories of heaven, and take a human body upon himself and become a man. Become a man that he would allow himself to be tempted in all points as we are, get the victory that he knew we could not get, so he could develop a perfect human righteousness for us in this body. And not only that, that through the Holy Spirit he would be able to live in us, and when whenever we are tempted, he could continue to give us his victory if we simply ask him. We certainly have much to celebrate as we partake of the bread. Let's eat. This cup represents the shed blood of Jesus. Jesus living the perfect sinless life enabled him to be the perfect sacrifice. This cup represents the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. He died the death, not that he deserved, but that we deserve. He took upon himself all of our sins to such a degree that our sins separated him from the Father. And he was forced to cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that point, he could not see through the tomb. He loved us more than he did himself. He was willing to go that far that we might have eternal life. So again, with thankfulness in our heart, let us take the cup and celebrate the wonderful gift of eternal life that we have through Jesus Christ and his blood. Jesus said that um, he came to this world that he might save the lost. In the Great Gospel Commission, he called all of us to join in that work of saving the lost. And he knew that would be a success because all power in heaven was given to him. And also the Baptist Holy Spirit was available to us. Hi. I'm Dennis Smith, pastor of the Clearview Seventh Avenue Church. We're located at 19554 North Papaco Drive in Surprise, Arizona. The major focus in our church is, of course, on Jesus Christ and also on prayer and the Holy Spirit. I find it interesting that when Christ gave us what's called the Lord's Prayer, as part of that prayer, we were to ask the Father that His will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And that's fascinated me for years. And it had a major impact in my life and as a pastor to realize that when God wants something done in this world, it's absolutely essential that we as Christians ask Him to do it. And that gives Him the rite of passage. So in our church here in Surprise, we have as our mission statement to be Spirit-filled, Spirit-empowered, and Spirit-led. I'd like to invite you to visit us when you're in our area, our Sabbath school service, begins at 9.20 on Saturday morning. 
And our worship service begins at 11 o'clock on Saturday morning. Hope to see you then.